Hi, this is Andrius Kulikowskas of Math for Wisdom with uh, Kirby Erner, uh, my very uh, special guest. And uh, we just uh, spoke some time on Zoom. I just want to summarize. Uh, I had asked Kirby what's his deepest value in life and uh, including all of his other values. He said clarity, uh, where the dust is settled and you can see clearly, an aesthetic value. And I also asked him, what's a question you don't know the answer to, but that you wish to answer? And he said, are we, the humans, going to make it? Uh, get over the crises of crises. And so I asked if, uh, and just to, for clarity, <laughs> to reward it. And uh, so is there a way that humans can step away from living in crisis mode? He said, that's, uh, that's uh, fine. And so what we're talking about, we're actually getting to know each other for the first time in um, communication mode uh, where we know each other uh, from email. Uh, I think it's Maria Drukova's um, mailing list, um, Natural Math, is that right? Uh, so I... she's an educator, Kirby's an educator um, who um, is a um, sprawling thinker about um, math education and all of life uh, that will come out. And what I'm asking to talk about uh, as we get to know each other is uh, uh, maybe clarity on this uh, possibilities of math for wisdom, uh, what are possible shared interests you know, that he might have. So to learn more about Kirby, that's the goal. And so we're practicing recording. So if you uh, enjoy this, it's because uh, we succeeded <laughs> in talking. Thank you, Kirby. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'll just layer a nuance on top of those answers I gave is that I, I said I was kind of stealing uh, my value clarity from philosopher named Ludwig Wittgenstein. We talked about him. Um, we're very, Andreas is very fluent about many topics, including philosophy. And he asked first or second Wittgenstein philosophy. So that proved to me, he knows a lot. <laughs> and, uh, then a concrete, a concrete measure that we're backing away from crisis mode. I'm wondering if we have that ability would be, I mentioned that clock in the a bulletin of atomic mm -hmm. scientists, the clock, they're always moving closer to midnight. I'm saying, can I imagine a world where we would back it off like a whole 15 minutes? What would it look like if instead of one minute or less, we were 15 minutes you know, what would that look like? Because we seem to need suspense and having the clock very close to midnight, it feels like it's like advertising almost. And it's a way we stay awake in a way is to kind of scare ourselves into doing something. So I I think crisis mode, maybe, maybe for me to get clear is to realize that I should allow more space for crisis mode, because I'm always thinking it's something we need to fix. We're too too close to the brink. How do we pull back? Maybe maybe we need to be here. It's always that sense of impending doom that keeps us going. I don't know. That's a good question. And, and so what that brings to mind for me, and uh, also maybe to add my own layer, is that uh, one of the purposes of this conversation and uh, all of Math for Wisdom, especially in the coming year, is to learn to have a scientific community to talk about that kind of question, right? Using Math for Wisdom, right? So that there is wisdom. Uh, and so one of the whole concepts, I'm, I'll give another little bit of activity I'm doing. Uh, I've made a friend in Lithuania who um, was uh, in a correctional facility and I was the godfather of his son. So I got to know the father uh, because of that and he's now free. Uh, and uh, he had invited me to give seminars uh, on independent thinking um, in the correctional facility. And so to ask these types of questions, like what is your deepest value? What's the question you don't really ask you, et cetera. And he really wants to go back. So we're gonna offer to go back. Um, and I think that the people there would uh, be impressed to see somebody who had gone through that and then come back. But um, one of those issues uh, that I think we will offer is like, well, could you create your own philosophy of life? So the idea is that there's something healthy for the people who want to, to be creating their own philosophies of life, number one. 
But then number two, we can say, well, what do all these philosophies have in common where they could have a shared language, right? Which is my more interest you, because I'm interested in absolute truth. So in a certain sense, I'm not really interested in relative philosophy, but that's like the key stage towards being to admit that, well, have empirical evidence. So that's one of the reasons I ended up collecting these deepest values and uh, these questions is that, well, empirically, when you realize that mature independent thinkers really tend to have them, you know, that says a lot, you know, and then that gives us a way to start to communicate. So um, then into, in, I wanted to jump in with regard to these uh, clock and, you know, pulling by clock, where that, where that gets me to think is um, uh, for me, this notion of God, which um, can be imaginary or not, and, you know, has different implications. But I think that uh, by having, and First of all, by having a notion of God, that kind of alters this a little bit, because maybe somebody, you have this perspective that somebody cares, like whether we destroy ourselves or not, but, you know, has something that was, but also like if you think a lot about God as I do, you know, or try to look at the limits of my vision, the kind of thing that God would be interested in is like, is God necessary? Would there be a God if there was no God? So this whole idea that, you know, you can have a world where there's no God or, or you know, but God still kind of emerges somehow. So that's basically like the kind of world we live in. Uh, and so uh, with regard to the crisis mode, like if you don't have God, it's easy to understand like why you would kind of veer towards crisis mode in a certain sense. It's almost a proof that there is kind of like a God because you're creating the need for a God. On the other hand, like if there is a God, then you also have the same dilemma where that God would probably want to double check you know, themselves and say, well, do I really, am I really necessary? And so they would create that precisely that kind of environment where people would be drifting towards that. So the plus side though, of knowing the game, so to speak. So like Wittgenstein uh, talks, the second Wittgenstein talks about, the first Wittgenstein talks about like the, I guess the, the basics of knowledge and life and everything and how do you build from that. But the second one says, well, it's really more about being in a game, let's say, right? So like these different games. So try to imagine God's game and uh, to say, well, if that's the game God's playing, we can play that game much more relaxed if we understand the game, you know, that there's this game and that this is like, so that in the video I talk about like God doesn't have to be good, you know, life isn't fair. Once you are kind of uh, take that as a given, the game changes. Uh, and so, uh, and so th that's like, for me would be like the kind of way I would imagine, like if, if we had a culture, if we had a world culture, not necessarily but a world culture that kind of said, look, we're going to be going through a lot of crises. Could we just like learn to kind of like uh, Israel and terrorism that people like learn to live with certain amount of terrorism, certain amount, like they seem to have a functional society on some many levels, uh, you know, certainly make a lot of effort. Uh, and so could the planet be like that? That's, that's where you brought me, Kirby. Yeah, I think uh, what, when I'm listening to your talking, I'm thinking how as I've been growing up, I was saying earlier, I'm like 64 years old now, mm -hmm. yellow submarine, all that. <laughs> but I'm thinking um, when I was growing up, there was always uh, kind of a doom and gloom culture about, you know, the world might be ending. And it was because of overpopulation. And, you know, there's just nothing to keep us from doubling and doubling, and it's just going to be horrible. Mm -hmm. And now, I watch YouTube and now it's kind of tipped over and people are worried we're not doing replacement rate. The population is shrinking. It might get too small. And then China, people were, when I was growing up, you know, there's a billion people there. They're never going to be able to feed themselves. They're going to have giant famines and be forced to invade all their neighbors. The, just the, the, the mm -hmm. pressure of poverty will cause China to spin out of control and all this. And now it's like, oh, they're so successful and they're competing and they might, you know, wipe us out as the economic superpower. I'm talking like a US person often thinks. And I'm saying, you can't, you have it no matter what happens. China, China is a basket case. China is super successful. It's always a cause for whining and complaining. And, and population is too much. Oh, no, now it's going to be too little. Always whining and complaining. And to me, it seems wisdom seems to be the opposite of always whining and complaining, right? Mm -hmm. It seems mm -hmm. like people who we call wise, 
don't just get on a soapbox and whine and complain because anyone can do that. That's very easy. So it doesn't seem that wise. Right. So what is wisdom in the world? What does it do? How does it? And I feel the answer is somehow it cools our heads. We're not hotheads. The opposite of wisdom is hothead. I think a hothead is someone who thinks they know everything already. They just want to walk into the room and take command with, with such uh, arrogance in a way. Uh, I think wisdom has humility in, in it. And, you know, the thing that, the thing that's scary about people on a quest for wisdom, going to the mountains, finding a teacher, whatever, is that they become like in Lord of the Rings, right? The ring is a paradox. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to become, oh, now I have the truth and their eyes become lit up and they stare mm -hmm. at you and it's like they're, they've become a maniac. So wisdom is always up against this other thing that it can flip into where you become um, too much of a believer in one thing. You know what I mean? Well, so for so several things, um, thank you. Um, this idea of asking people, you know, what is wisdom and having that as part of the conversation. I think that that's a very good uh, uh, way to proceed. Another one um, to um, ask people like, what kind of wisdom should we try to model? You see, so like, you know, what is, so, you know, with mathematics, let's say. So I think that that's a very uh, helpful way to proceed um, in terms of making it. And then, of course, when we do that, um, we don't have to agree on what wisdom is. In fact, we might be able to agree on what it is not. Let's say, And you give good arguments. I feel like um, so this whole cognitive language of cognitive frameworks or language of wondrous wisdom, as I talk about, one of the things uh, that's um, maybe nice about it is that I didn't have to go to somebody else to, to learn it. You know, like I fig I was able to figure it out on my own. So the idea is that somebody else could also, but that it has this tentative uh, nature. So it's just this whole language that kind of builds and you see one thing, it's a, it's a language of game, so to speak. I'll be able to explain that further, but, but the idea is that you see this game, like one all many is a game, let's say of the Wittgenstein type saying, um, uh, so it's interesting, like one all many, like Kant had the similar thing, but he said kind of in the maybe sense, like he said, oh, these are primitives that uh, happen when you think about a sentence, you know, that the sentence can refer to one all or many or whatever. But the idea is that, no, these are not um, categories in the sense of things or objects. These are like backdrops of the imagination. These are like canvases for the imagination. So it's like a hole that you can put something in and then the canvas will give it meaning. And so the game is like that uh, way of giving it meaning. And the game says uh, that there's oneness and there's allness and there's uh, manyness. And so if you play the game, that means you understand what oneness and allness and manyness mean and you know how to use these. So I kind of went off a little bit. <laughs> but, to, but so what the, what the point is that everything I build has this kind of nature where it's tentative, like, like Kirby said, well, what about the void, you know, or the fourth or whatever, like, and then I have to be able to say, well, shoot, I was wrong. <laughs> you know, like, a, or I have to be able to explain, but basically I have to explain like why that particular game and not some other game, you know, like um, uh, to be able to say like, everything has to be retested all the time, you know, and if you get new information, you just realize, well, shoot, you were, I was wrong, you know, and I, it doesn't fall. Or I have to be able to explain, no, Kirby, you see, you're meaning actually something different, possibly this, possibly that, possibly that, but there's just no other way to fit in this game anything else, you know. But partly that's in the case like the one on many is just you do it and you don't see any more, you know, ways out of that room. You only see three doors, you know, that, for me. So I can't prove that there's not a fourth door. I'm just saying empirically that game has three doors out that I'm aware of. And so um, I like that kind of world where, uh, so what that means is you're never able to say uh, absolute truth in a kind of like um, locked and shut way. It's absolute truth in a pragmatic way to say like, that's an absolute truth, this one on many, but in a very pragmatic way, like to say like, well, we couldn't come up with anything else. No one's come up with anything else, you know, you know so we're not gonna pretend there's something else, but like, if, if you can say, well then tell us, you know, we're interested. 
um, that seems to be. I think you, um, when you say three doors, you know, that gets my imagination going, which was mm -hmm. your point. It's not just about the words. Right. I try to imagine you in a three door situation, right? There's the, there's that famous puzzle with the three doors where you're supposed to guess which one has the car, which one has the goat, whatever. I know you don't mean that game, but that's no, like a, a Monty, common Monty game Hall, yeah. with doors, right? Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. But you, yours sounds more like you're in a, like you mentioned being in a correctional facility. And there's a lot I could say about that. I think a lot, I was mentioning earlier, I'm interested in the Buckminster Fuller stuff and I was holding up the new biography mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by Alec Navalo Lee, who knows a lot about science fiction. But Fuller's critique of Western culture or any culture actually was maybe that we were too right angled in our thinking, too rectilinear. And so if you're in a prison cell, how many doors? Well, if it's in zero G, right, it's just zero gravity, mm -hmm. no wall or there's no particular floor or ceiling. But the minimum number of walls you could have to contain you would be four triangles and there'd be four doors to leave from. Mm -hmm. If every wall has a door, mm -hmm. there's four doors. So I'm showing you how to go from three to four. Right. And that, that's your minimum containment. I think of what is our meaning of container? What do you spontaneously think of? One thing you might think of is a suitcase. A suitcase is a container. And when I teach object-oriented programming and Python, which I do a lot, I think of, I always talk about suitcase. And then you have a tag on your suitcase, like your, your luggage tag mm -hmm. with your name on it. That's how we name something. We tie a little tag on mm -hmm. this big, heavy suitcase. Because in Python, the object that you're naming, it might be very light or it might be huge. It might be like a steam engine, like a train. That's an object. But the name is always just very light, a little little label, you know, has no what weight. What would be really. the name here? I, I don't. Anyway, I'm just riffing. Oh, like so a to... luggage tag on this handle sure, of your but... suitcase. So, um... And you can have multiple tags on the same object. So you can name it in many different namespaces. I love the concept of namespace, which I link to language game. Mm -hmm. I was mentioning chess and checkers like even the word God, I think it depends on what game you're in when you say any word or say anything. Right. This was the Wittgenstein view that how you use the word is where we're going to finally get the meaning and everyone's different. So if I walk mm -hmm. in and hear you start to use these words, it's a, not wise for me to think I know what you mean right away. I have to listen to how you use the words for some extended period and then try to put it together. Oh, this is how he uses the word. And then the last thing I'll say is the other side of Wittgenstein's philosophy is not just how we use words, but in some, some situations, it all comes together and something shifts in our perception, like the neck or cube where it goes inside out. Optical, there's things that suddenly jump out at us mm -hmm. that we didn't see before. And I think we feel we're on the right path when that happens to us. So in a way, uh, we're looking for wisdom to surprise us with new insights. If you feel like you know it all and you're never mm -hmm. surprised, that's a, a downside, right? That means maybe you're in a dead end. You've got to find a, a, but, a mathematics but... that is capable of surprising. Well, and I think to be able to, you know, especially given that our minds are limited, you know, at least mine is, you know, um, to be able to model that surprise and relive it, to say, look, I could surprise myself endlessly, I, like infants do, you know, <laughs> like infants go into these road things, wow, that, that's, I surprised myself again, you know, that they can do that. So they have that exploratory care. I wanted to add to that um, whole, um, I think, um, I forget if it was talking about God or whatever, but this idea with these frameworks that uh, you end up having like a double point of view, like, you know, so that in the sense, which is, which is very much not that uh, like know it all or that uh, like, so this idea of parallel thing to say, like, I have this structure, like one all many, which seems to be absolute, but I'm able to always say, you know, could be, needs to be supposed, could be tested, could be challenged, could be wrong, you know. But, you know, it has the, it works, it functions as absolute truth in the sense that like, you know, everything we know, you know, everything we've done, it's, it's survived all the challenges. 
which is kind of like how you know physical theories today work you know that you they have this kind of you know and that's why they're very attractive is that you you can take both uh, perspectives on them that's what my wanted to say most important i guess i had other things but so i don't know what your value was oh, do, do you I'll have say, a yeah, um, my deepest value uh, is living by truth, which I mean by like absolute truth. <laughs> so, and so uh, like with every person, um, that is very uh, kind of actually, it's my it's my strong point and weak point, you know. So, on the one hand, I really want to be absolute truth, so I don't want to lie. I don't want to. On the other hand, I may be quite creative with the truth, you know, so I can go very, you know places people wouldn't normally go with truth you know or living by truth or whatever but um and then maybe like, um <clears throat> maybe to add to what you're saying so one video um that i'll be working on uh in order to show that wisdom is applicable and and to show that the kind of things i've been working on are useful is the challenge of um uh, the russia's invasion of ukraine you know, so what to do, how to bring peace to Russia and Ukraine. And I have a practice on looking, you know, loving your enemy, looking at everything from your enemy's point of view. Uh, so, uh, and actually even mathematically modeling, like, so for the needs um, that I show that there's a picture of the needs and there's, oh, I, I guess I'll have to maybe walk through that again someday, but there, there's for doubts and, 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 um, and uh, counter questions like, uh, and so, and then th this actually comes up in uh, ways of engaging violent people, like to be flexible in how you approach them so that you can look at anything from their point of view. You could let go of your own point of view. I'll be thinking about that, talking about that. But um, yeah, that's what um, maybe, so maybe you have thoughts on peacemaking. Well, I'll mention a little autobiographical material here and that I, I grew up in Europe from like what we'd call third grade Mm -hmm. Except then I was in first form. That was, I went to a, a British school mm -hmm. for one year in Italy. So I had to wear a tie. It was quite mm -hmm. a different culture. But the alternative, my parents thought I would, they would enroll me in an Italian school mm -hmm. and I would be immersed and therefore I would come out speaking Italian and stuff. Mm -hmm. But kids my age were supposed to wear like this, kind of like a smock and a big bow. I mean, to me, it just looked ridiculous. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And so they put me in a British school where I had to wear a tie. Anyway, <laughs> I just grew up um, traveling from Rome as my base. My father and mm -hmm. my mother and my sister, we would get in the station wagon and just drive all over Europe. And at one time I could boast I had been to every country. Uh, country in Europe and at that time Lithuania was part of the USSR so that didn't mm -hmm. count as its own country right right or was that am I right about that were they part of the USSR yes we were an occupied or yeah, not yeah we were an occupied country it, and it was a Soviet Republic yes Lithuania as an entity was considered one of the republics exactly right? like we were but not we, like Poland Poland was federal, always independent but we were there you we, go we were incorporated so, um you know by right. So I, guess, mm -hmm. I could say at one point that I had been to every wow. European country except Albania and Poland. Those were the only two I had not been to. So I was very proud of that. But what I did not understand, somehow as a kid, you, th you see things like nation states and you assume finally they've solidified. You read history and they're always changing. But no, in my mm -hmm. lifetime, it's, this is how it is. But I realized since then, of course, it's not like that. It's like a bubbling cauldron and national borders are freaking always changing all over the place. And then you can't even trust the ones that are there. I mean, they only become a they, you can leave them alone and they're not a problem it is until people want to just cross them at will. Like the U.S. has a border with Mexico mm -hmm. that everyone's screaming about now. If you look historically that has never been something you could fence off. Like there's never been a great wall there. It's huge territory we're talking mm -hmm. about. And Ukraine, it's got the same problem. And Russia, they don't have a fence. Uh, there's mm -hmm. no impermeable barriers. And so in many ways, I would say that the nation state 
system. We have it. It's something that we've worked very hard to have. But in a way, it's between our ears. It's science fiction. It's programming. It doesn't exist out there. And, and so maps and how we portray the world, how we look at the world globes, that's data visualization. Right. And, and sometimes it's just nice to turn that off. So with Bucky Fuller, as I was saying, he created a globe and a world map where if you're tired of the nation state layer, which is a data layer, you can easily switch it off and just look at the planet without all that stuff. So when I look at the Russia, Ukraine and all this stuff, I don't just turn off Russia and Ukraine as nations. I turn them all off. Right. And I just look That's at the world that way. And it's like yeah. Google. It's like Google Earth. You still see all the people and you still see the tanks. You still see the guns. But you see people are programmed. They come to an imaginary line and they stop and they say, oh, Russia starts here. But that's like, OK, it's like ants in an ant farm. They are well programmed. They, they do right. understand nations. But I don't have to see them. I can just see people believing in them very strongly so, so, and waving um, flags and all that stuff. I find that helpful and kind of like relating to God, like, you know, you can turn God on and turn God off, you know, and then look at the difference. So I think similarly, like to turn the nations off, but then to turn them back on ah, and say, I have the like, map right it? here. There is the map oh, I'm talking about. I see. There's this, no I, nations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. color is from a uh, global average temperature, but you can put other data. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then for contrast, I have the more traditional map. And I, I think it's it's poetic that we're allowed to put nations on this one, which is a very crazy map, you know. Right. Like, look what they do to Antarctica. That's an important place. Right. And they just like splatter it. Mm -hmm. And then Greenland, it looks so huge, right? Greenland looks bigger than Africa almost in some of these maps. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about mathematics and wisdom, I think a question might be, how can mathematics be used to clarify or make our thinking clearer? Or how can mathematics be used to distort our thinking, even willfully? Like I think mathematics can be abused as well as used. So in order to study wisdom, you need to look for what's not wise use, that kind of thing. Right. But I don't know how to do that. I'm not telling you that I know no, the answers. No, but I think, but I think you're bringing a good question. And I think in general, um, what we're trying to do together uh, and what we'll be doing um, at Math for Wisdom is this I, learning to dialogue. So um, one of the keys for me in looking at our enemy's point of view, you know, is to say, uh, if we could let other people kind of like explain more, like what is it that they want, you know, and to listen more, um, then we could, um, um, then we would have a chance of, of serving them, you know. And so uh, it could, whether it is uh, President Putin or President Zelensky or the Russian people or the Ukrainian people. So one step I'm taking uh, that I feel uh, encouraged about, it may work out is, uh, uh, early on, about half a year ago, I contacted um, the leader, Yelena Budkevicheni, of the um, of the ethnic minority center in Klaipeda, Lithuania, which is our port city, which has a sizable uh, Russian uh, minority and, and other Russian-speaking minorities and other non-Russian-speaking minorities. And there's been a lot of effort uh, that they've made to um, just... Um, be working on issues in Lithuania, you know, that uh, affect minorities and their inclusion. And so, of course, with the war, it's been very troubling. And now we have uh, tens of thousands of Ukrainian uh, refugees also. And so uh, I was encouraged that I will be writing a, a, a letter uh, to the chairwoman of um, the Ethnic Minority Council in Klaipeda to ask, could we have dialogue, uh, especially among uh, Russian speakers uh, or, you know, and related people who understand Russian, let's say, just to, just to be able to practice the variety of views, you know, how do people look at the various issues? Can we learn to talk about them, to learn to listen to other people? And if we could do that, you see, what does that do? 
if people of goodwill try to learn to talk together, um, it becomes possible to tease out the different solutions and tie them, you know, weave them together nicely. So it could just be 10 people. Um, but I have done, I have worked on that in Lithuania. We had a um, uh, controversy here because uh, the Soviets built a sports palace in Vilnius on the oldest Jewish cemetery. And so they built that sports palace, uh, you know, whereas the oldest Jewish, it included the graves of the Gaon of Vilna, who's like a very famous Jewish uh, thinker, you know, one of the people of the millennium. And so um, they, that would be very hurtful to Jews, except that the official Lithuanian Jewish community had sided with the government in its uh, uh, plans to convert it into a European convention center, you see. So it had kind of like a, it had its own negotiation with, you know, which is just very disturbing. But so Jewish dissidents and a handful of Lithuanian dissidents said, no, no, this is not good for anybody. But, you know, we had no power. They had all the power. But by bringing together di in dialogue these dissidents of different uh, cultures, Lithuanian and uh, Litvak, Jewish, and meeting over a year and then just having small demonstrations, you know, once a month at the site, et cetera, and then writing three letter campaigns during the budget process. By being, by learning how to think about it and talk about it, we were able to uh, end the budget thing. We just kind of show that, you know, they're just not going to get away with this. And so they gave up a project that was valued at like 64 million euros. You see, so 10 people basically were able to sink 64 million. Now we never got credit for it. We were never really acknowledged for it, but we won. And so I think you can imagine 10 people in Klaipeda could come together and say, you know, Russians uh, feel hurt about these things. They would feel dignity by these ways and Ukrainians likewise. And this is an arrangement that would make people feel more human and have potential for long-term, you know, friendship restored. Now that's of course very hard, but that's the kind of group that could do it. Then you go say, well, we're doing it in Klaipeda. How about Latvia, which has much more um, difficulties, you know, but much more stronger money, but which is also now a center of Russian opposition. Uh, they're moving from Moscow to Riga, Latvia. You see, so you can do it in Latvia. You can have this dialogue. Then maybe in Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, you could have this dialogue. So it looks just like a handful of people. But um, And so let me give an example of types of projects. Um, one project we could do where we learn to work together is to make a petition to give thanks to uh, Russia and its president, Ukraine and its president, Turkey and its president, United Nations, for um, negotiating uh, the agreement on a grain uh, export to the world, to feed the world. You know, like to say, I mean, thousands of people, millions of people could sign a petition thanking all these parties for feeding the world, giving peace a chance. Now, how could that hurt? You see, like that kind of thing. Uh, so there's these different, um, this is just an example of like uh, uh, how we could practice dialogue and try to see, can we achieve something with that? And, and, uh, and bring, let... back, bring back your clock hand. That's, that was the whole connection. <laughs> right, right. We want to move the clock back. I want viewers to know if we use this to introduce both of us that I've been to Lithuania not that long ago, right? Mm -hmm. Because of my connections in the Python computer language world, like in that subculture, I've been very active for a long time. And that's been my ticket to Sweden before that, Göteborg, Gothenburg, we call it in English, and then Vilnius. Mm -hmm. And I went while I was in Vilnius to what we call the KGB museum. Oh yeah. But it was a history of uh, what's been going on. You know, Lithuania is very exposed position. It's in the middle of nowhere, you could say. By that, I mean, it's not protected, right? Right. It, it's been invaded by Germany and then by Russians and then by Germany. And, you know, like So difficult history. But when I was there, everyone was really um, happy with life and um, everyone was getting married. Every Saturday, it seemed, or Sunday, that was everyone getting married all over town. I also have been in Russia and here, my family just our little, my mom and dad and myself, in the time that I did this, it was possible for us to get on a public bus in Peshawar in Pakistan 
and go across the Khyber Pass in a public bus and go to Kabul and hang out there and then get on Aeroflot and fly to Tashkent and hang around there and then go to Moscow, St. Petersburg, and then on to Finland, Helsinki, I think we went. Um, I feel that the world in a way has gone back backwards because mm -hmm. I couldn't do that today. The Khyber Pass, totally militarized. I could do it maybe, but I don't think I would. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I just feel like even getting back to the, to sometimes we've been in the past would be better. My family was in Israel one summer. We also were in Palestine. It was Ramallah, right outside mm -hmm. of Jerusalem, and we were hoping to foster more understanding, as you talk about, between these communities. And the goal was to do something together hands-on. And it was mm -hmm. build a swimming pool in Ramallah, which is very difficult because it's solid rock. And we had to have jackhammer people and even dynamite. And the Palestinians at that time, the construction company, they had no problem authorized use of dynamite was not a problem. Um, I feel like things, have, that was this summer that Bobby Fischer and Boris Spassky were playing chess. And I think that was a high point. Yeah, yeah. That was when the US-USSR relationship was going in a good direction. And then mm -hmm. came detente and Gorbachev. I look to my past and I can say there were times that were better than this in terms of the international climate. And I don't wanna be like too retro, like, oh, you can never bring back the past. No, but there were things that were working that we should go back to look at again, right? So we, like have, we should not. We have about. We have, about we have like one minute left, but just to maybe to ask you for concluding thoughts on uh, what we could try to work on math for wisdom. But if you could maybe phrase a prayer, um, just uh, how could math for wisdom contribute to setting back that clock hand? You know that you right. live more sane. I think. You're a process, you've managed communities before, you've done listservs, you are obviously you have skills in that region. And so if we and you and we can recruit people from these different ethnic backgrounds, like if we could have some yes. Russians and some Ukrainians who are also into math for wisdom, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a political process. No. And when we get together, it's not necessarily to solve the war, Right. But because we are from these different backgrounds, inevitably we will discuss the war. It's we not like open to, we will be looking open to, to that. Yeah, we will be. Yeah, open. yeah. But that's we not will. our main goal. I think that's a good way to think. Right. About it. Open to that, though. Because there are many tensions in the world. Like, you know, the Dalai Lama, he wants in a way to secularize so that all the religions contribute their best thinking, but in a kind of a neutral environment where they get along because it's secular. So he's embracing secularism in a way. And when you so look I'll at just, India- I'll just conclude with an amen and okay. we'll try and we're, we're, we will work together. Thank you, Kurt. That's Please join our email discussion group, Math for Wisdom at freelist.org more information at mathforwisdom.com. Thank you for being with us, for thinking alongside us, for liking and subscribing, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon.